Uh, yeah, thanks for coming to my talk, even though it's, uh, for me, it's uh, very early in the morning. <laughs> um, yeah, today I would like to talk about, um, actually I would say a very um, easy topic and actually a soft topic, but uh, not for us, especially in the sense of way um, when you need to scale, right? So today I'm going to talk about um, image classification or image tagging, um, and especially how we make it easier for people uh, to use it. Uh, and we build a library, which is called Image ATM. Um, we chose this word because it sounds cool, because you need a cool name for a good library, right? Uh, but ATM doesn't stand you know, for like the, the, the banking machine that you know, but it's for automated tagging machine. Um, before going into the topic, I um, just want to introduce myself. So my name is Dad. I'm currently part of Axel Springer Ideas Engineering, um, which is the innovation unit of the Axel Springer Group. I'm going to talk a little bit also as well, a little bit short while for, about Axel Springer, because uh, a lot of people are really confused uh, that they believe it's Springer Nature, but it's not. It's a different company. Springer is a very uh, popular name in the past in Germany. Um, so that's my team. That's me. We won a competition in an uh, internal uh, custom uh, match. Um, I'm also um, building up and heading Axel Springer AI, um, which is uh, the AI unit of Axel Springer. It's a new unit. We are a new team. Um, um, and yeah, basically, um, you can expect from us more coming up in the next few months, uh, also years, So it, because it's a, it's a new thing, and we need a while to, to set it up. Um, before that, I used to work for one of the daughter companies of uh, Axel Springer, which is called Idealo. It's a very big price comparison website in Europe, actually the biggest in, in Germany. Um, and um, that was my team. We were mainly focused on computer vision. Um, then a long time ago, I was working for Pivotal, Pivotal Labs, which is uh, a software company, especially I was in the service arm and uh, heading up the, um, the German uh, office uh, for data science. Um, and yeah, we usually help to uh, digitalize Volkswagen, one of the biggest car makers uh, in the world. Okay, so I also do a lot of uh, fun projects, you know, from uh, just, you know, face to face, uh, but also, but I would say most of my code is not public, so I, I you know, work on things like hydroponic prediction, but also like uh, sorting images according to aesthetic or any other topics. Um, I also like to do open source, so some of the code is on GitHub, um, and also I like to write about the stuff. It's, uh, some of them is, are on Medium. Um, okay, let's go for the gender. Um, first of all, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of motivation why we needed to do that, uh, and why it was important for us. Uh, then give you a short introduction to image classification. I think some of you are already aware of uh, what image classification problems are. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the library, showing a little bit of code as well, and then uh, yeah, just conclude the talk with uh, um, like also a little bit of roadmap, what, we, what our plans are for the library, and how you actually can help to, to, to support the library itself in the future. Okay, um, so in terms of motivation, I want to start with the company itself. Uh, it's very short. So uh, this is Build. It's a very popular uh, newspaper in, in Germany. Uh, it's popular, I mean, it's a... Uh, it's a very tabloid way, like, you know, uh, it was uh, founded in 1952, and uh, basically it is our main flag newspaper. And, um, since then, we change. Uh, we, we are a Europe's uh, leading digital publisher in, in Europe. Uh, we have approximately 60,000 employees. We have 180 brands, uh, 250 brands, and we are over 40 countries. Um, and of course, our main business is still journalism, but we also have a lot of other businesses like classifieds, uh, price comparison, and so on. Um, here are some of the brands. Um, some of you probably are aware of Business Insider. So uh, this is a company that is owned by Axel Springer and uh, it's very uh, popular in the US, um, I think also worldwide, um, and especially for the videos, and I don't know why <laughs> sometimes. Um, but today I want to focus on Idealo, which is a price comparison website. And so this is how Idealo looks like, basically. So uh, like a typical, you know, maybe e-commerce or price comparison website, what do you do? You come there, right? You're looking for a product, right? And uh, you search for something, like especially when you want to go shopping, right? And the company itself has been 18 years old. They have 800 people. Um, so this is about Idealo. 
uh, what's a business model? The business model is, is very simple. So you have shops like Amazon or Auto or Salano or whatever, right? And they have a lot of data, like shopping data, right? And they just send it to, the, to, the, to our website, right? And uh, overall, we have 330 million offers. So there's a lot of uh, offers that we have. Um, and what do we do then? You know, we have this website, we crunch it, and then, you know, we have at the end of our end customers, right? And the end customers, they just want to have a perfect shopping experience. Uh, what a lot of people don't know, this process is actually a lot of manual work. So uh, the team itself, we have like 180 people who just, you know, do this number crunching. You know, they, they type in the product, they uh, fill in with more information, additional information, uh, but then also they um, sort images or something like that, right? Or pr create a product gallery. Um, and this is like one of the use cases. So when you type in a product, for example, this is a helmet, right? Uh, you go into the helmet and you see you have uh, the name, the price, uh, and then you have also the, the listings, right? And you know, uh, this is like a typical um, shopping experience. But one uh, important experience is you also want to have images, right? Because the thing is, when you go offline, you can see the product. When it's online, you know, you still want to see how it looks like. Um, but the problem, this process here is very manual. And uh, our goal was basically to, to um, kind of automate that. So if I show you um, a short video, how it looks like with a content team who actually need to do that. So we have this uh, content team tool. Uh, they basically go, uh, they type in the helmet that is already automatically pulled in. And basically they pull in all the images from different shops, right? So it's like random. So if like, for example, they shows this product here, it's called Abyss. Um, you know, they give some suggestion and you know, you get a lot of this stuff. So, and then the thing is the content guy, you know, he has to sort the images right now, right? Uh, and then, uh, of course, he has to uh, some, then delete stuff that is uh, not necessary, right? Or that we don't want to show um, on, on the website itself. Um, of course, if you do it for one, like, you know, product, it's, it's fine, right? I mean, this is not uh, stuff, it's like 40 seconds, 50 seconds. But if we have like 330 million products every day and we get like over a million updates every day and you have to do it every day, I think it's very mundane and you know, you don't want to do that, right? It's not a fun, uh, fun thing. Um, and optimally, you know, you would like to have this perfect product gallery, right? Where you have uh, left profile, left, right profile, rear, front, right? So you want, to have a, you want to have something that is automatic, but also something that, you know, sorts the images already in a way that we want to display it uh, for the user. Uh, so what we do, we do. So we use, uh, image tagging, right, so we, we uh, classify it in a way, and then afterwards we implement it um, in, in our system. So basically what it does now is like, you know, um, you take in the helmets, um, but now there's this button, you cannot really see it, it's called uh, label erkennung, it's, in Germany it's called like uh, detection for labels, right? Um, it was still in the beta phase this time, and then, so, voila. So with machine learning, deep learning, right, with our tool, you basically can just, you know, have it in a perfect way without, you know, touching it. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, another use case that we have, uh, Idealo uh, has also a hotel price comparison, right? So they have like two million accommodation, um, that's like around 300 million images, so all, a lot of images. So if you divide it by all the accommodation, you have 133 images per accommodation. Um, what is the value of photo? So photos is very important, right? So if you go traveling or somewhere, I don't know, like, for maybe for to Germany, you look go in Airbnb or maybe on TripAdvisor or on us, right? And the first thing you also look at is, of course, like price and the photo, right? So because you don't want to stay in a, in a, in a place that is not really well, right? Um, and when we look at our website, we had a lot of problems. So for example, this is a listing for Berlin, right? So if you just go into this listing, uh, yeah, it's not something that you really want, right? So you don't really want uh, this woman as a first image displayed uh, for a listing, right? Um, and then, of course, when you go deeper, um, you have a lot of things. For example, you know, when you look at uh, this listing here, you have more images, right? Usually it's 100 images, so this here is only like a subset of the images that we have. And when we go in here, you know, we also have different orders, right? So we know that, hey, this image, uh, position 19, clearly looks better than position one, right? So I, I'm not quite sure, but for you, but for me, it looks. The same thing for the reception. I mean, uh, for me, even position 17, the reception looks better from the angle and everything like from position three, right? So uh, this problem, 
is actually, we also solve it, so because it's a two-fold problem. So beautiful images should appear earlier, earlier in the gallery, right? So you wanna have images that look better earlier in the gallery. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this, but if you wanna know more about this, um, we had a chance to write an uh, um, article on NVIDIA developers blog uh, about uh, image aesthetic, right? How to sort images, and also we open source the code, right, uh, on, on GitHub. So um, it's based basically on one of the Google papers about neural image assessment, and it uses basically the earth movement distance to kind of model this problem. Um, and yeah, we, we had amazing results. So this was one of the uh, very good projects that we, we basically finished. Um, but our problem is uh, image taking, right? So you look at this um, gallery again, right? So what do you see? You see a lot of beds, right? So they have bedrooms in a way. So what you want to want have is you want to ensure that different areas get depicted. So that's where image taking comes into play, right? So you want to have bedrooms, you want to have bathroom, you have restaurants, facade, fitness studio, kitchen, right? So this is uh, what you would like to have. And there's more uh, categories, right? There's also like a foyer, reception, and so on, maybe a pool as well, right? There's so many at the end of the day. Um, and then of course we had also a lot of during our time, ad hoc requests, you know, from different teams, like, hey, uh, we have this uh, special uh, winter thing, you know, in, in Europe, we like to go skiing, uh, and, you know, and during a certain period, everyone, like, you know, looks on the internet for some skiing places, right? And it's, it's very convenient if you're on a, a price comparison website and you can say, hey, I want to just show, like, winter images, right? Winter images that display it on a listing. So we had a lot of these requests as well. Um, as you can see, so the problem is, um, like from the first standpoint, the helmets is only one category, right? But overall, we have 2,000 product categories. So this is a lot, lot of categories overall. Um, then, of course, we have many, you know, these classes within the categories. We have a lot of hotel images, uh, ad hoc requests. And, of course, this is only one of our companies, right? If you think about our company itself, we have uh, over 180 companies. Uh, that means we have a lot of image tagging problems. It's not our, it's not only Idealo, right? So we think about Silogea, which is a very big uh, French uh, company in terms of when you're looking for apartments, or also when you think about um, um, Immo Immovelt, which is also a German one, right? They also have like images of, of apartments, right? So you also can reuse it for, for other use cases. Um, okay, so the problem though is, um, I mean, Image classification is a solved problem. And you just go on the internet, you take a cat versus a dog tutorial, right? Take Keras example, take a Jupyter notebook, right? And then you know you just run it through. But the problem is we need a tool that is really easy to run, right? So it really unrun for fast meditation. We also needed something uh, for non-machine learners, non-data scientists, like software engineers, right? Because the problem is um, you don't, in any company, you just don't have like 10 or 12 data scientists or whatever size of data scientists that understands you know, computer vision that understands uh, like image classification, right? So we needed a tool, something like that. And of course, it needs good documentation because software engineers, they love documentation, right? This is uh, how they use it. And uh, one other thing is uh, expanded AI, right? So it's, um, I'm gonna give a motivation later also why expanded AI is important. Um, yeah, just hold on for a moment. Okay, um, just a short introduction into image classification so that uh, every one of us is on board. Um, as I said, image classification is a very simple task. Basically, you know, you assign uh, an input image, a, a label, right? A label from a fixed set of categories. Uh, if you want to know more, so this is a link to uh, one of the article from Andre Kapaski. Uh, it's very well done. And basically, um, it's a supervised learning problem, right? So not, not, very, not very difficult. Um, there's a lot of examples that you can find in the internet. Um, Amnes, right, this is a typical example. Digital recognition from zero to nine. You have fashion Amnes, which is uh, um, um, another Amnes version, but with fashion from Salano, from one of my good friends, uh, Han Xiao, who put it out a couple of years ago. Uh, you have ImageNet, Cypher 10, and of course, Catverse Doc. So there's many, many of these uh, tagging examples. Um, how can you solve it? I mean, there's so many solutions out there, right? So you can even use support vector machines, you can use feed forward neural networks, right? Uh, you can use convolutional neural networks, you can CapsNet, right? So there's many, many of these solutions that you can use, but we mainly focus on CNNs. There's, because we are an industry, so that means we need a trade-off between you know, fast model, right, and also good accuracy. So it's not something that we can say, hey, we're gonna take state-of-the-art CapsNet models or any other model, right, and, and basically, uh, uh, because CapsNet is too slow for, for many of the use cases. 
Um, and of course, another important concept, um, transfer learning, right? So a state-of-the-art concept is you do transfer learning. Um, um, like in traditional machine learning, so compared to that, basically you have uh, two models, right? And then you basically train two models, learning system, right? In transfer learning, what you basically do is uh, you train a model on, I don't know, a, a task that is not related to each, right? Uh, you train a learning system, and from there you transfer the knowledge to this learning system, right, from another task, from another downstream task. So that's, that's how transfer learning works. Um, basically, in, for images, it's pretty simple. For example, you use a pre-trained convolutional network, um, for example, that was trained on millions of images, like uh, ImageNet or VGG16 or whatever, right? And then you could replace the top layers. In this sense, this was like trained on ImageNet, where it was 1,000 classes, and then you just, uh, like replace the last layer with your output, right? And then um, you basically train the existing layer, right? you know, and there's a lot of concepts as well. So it, it, there's also a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Because uh, a lot of people, you know, start to like train the whole layer, right? And then uh, hopeful, uh, hopefully uh, the output wait, but you know, there's a lot of uh, another concept that you can use to do that. Um, to train this, there's a lot of libraries. So um, you have Keras, you have TensorFlow, you have uh, FastAI that who's, who does things also very easy. You have PyTorch, MXNet. Uh, there's many, many out there, right? And so uh, why why did we do that then? So let's just go in the example of TF Keras because uh, that's uh, the most like you know new version of TensorFlow, and we are a heavy TensorFlow user because um, um, we like it. <laughs> there's no certain reason for that. But also we, we look into PyTorch for some reason for NLP, but uh, so far we, are, we have a good experiences with uh, TensorFlow because it's also made a lot of stuff for production-ready code. Uh, okay, what do we do? So we import some code, and then you know, in ten, TensorFlow Keras, uh, you can use the image data generator right, to load your images, do some pre-processing, uh, pre you know, you know, target size, and then of course do you know, train and validation split. Um, this is very uh, good because your generator, you know, he, uh, he loads the images iteratively, right? So it doesn't load everything into memory um, at the beginning. And then, you know, what you can do then, you can use uh, the function API from Keras, right, to define your model. Uh, you know, in this case, we use transfer learning with uh, ImageNet, right? We uh, put in the image input shape, 224, 224. That's, I think, normal. And then we add a trot-up layer, and then we add a dense layer, right? So nothing special. And then afterwards, you know, you compile the model, you train the model, you define your loss, right? You define your epochs. So there's, there's many things that you can do. Um, but from, from this one example, you can already see what, what, what is the problem. There's many ways to define your, the stuff in, in Keras, right? So you can use the sequential API, you can use the functional API, you can use the new subclassing API, right? So uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, for, for someone who's new in, in machine learning, that can be overwhelming, especially for software engineers, right? Because uh, what is this? I don't, I don't, I don't get it, all of the stuff, right? Um, and then you know uh, you have this stuff like test train validation split via the image data generator, or you can use scikit-learn to do that, right? So there's also you know different variability of of uh, sh solving your problems. And then you know you have the choice of models. Should, should I use MobileNet? Should I use ResNet? Should I use uh, VG16, 19, ResNet 152, right? There's so many out there, right? So it's not that easy. And then you have your optimizer, the same thing. Should I use Atom? Should I use SGD, right? It's, it's a lot of stuff, right? Your last function as well, metrics, number of epochs, 10, 15, 20, I don't know, right? It's, it's very, it's, for a software engineer, right, when he comes in and, and, and uh, sees that, he's like, wow, uh, what is this, right? It's, it's not, it's, it's stochastic, right? It's not easy for him to understand. And then, of course, you can train everywhere, right? You can, maybe you have your own cluster, you have Microsoft Azure, you have Google Cloud, AWS. So there's many, many, you can see many, many options. And this is only for TF Keras, right? So when you look at uh, other libraries, it's the same feeling, right? Like it's, overwhelming for people. Um, and of course, another motivation is uh, explaining AI, right? So in the past, like five years ago or something like that, you know, we trained a neural network and people were like, okay, this is a black box. I don't understand that, right? But over the last recent years, um, we had a shift that we need to understand our models. And there's been a lot of research going on uh, in this area, right? Um, and basically, why is this important? So very, one very important uh, example that I took here is uh, it's about biases and ethics and biases, right? So this is uh, a tweet from someone uh, a long time ago when Google, you know, uh, automatically tagged Google Photos, right? And in, in this example, I don't know if sure you can see that, uh, it's a black woman and a black uh, man, and it's uh, labeled as a gorilla, right? Uh, I mean, 
we know how gorillas look like, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, in this case, it's a human being, but uh, the problem is uh, Google at this point, when they trained the model, they didn't have enough data of like black people or like Asians or something like that, right? So a lot of data is like, you know, um, like biased with white people, right? So that means you need to understand what is your model actually selecting at the end of the day. Uh, another, of course, um, GDPR, we love GDPR, Joking, <laughs> but uh, in GDPR, you know, you also say, "Hey, yeah, uh, there's a rule, right? So you need to basically, um, um, P uh, someone in Europe can demand from a company, uh, right, especially when you have machine learning in production, right? So why was the decision made, right? So what was the reason? So you and you have to give them the reason. If you don't give them the reason, uh, they can fire you for a lot of money, right? So that's very important that." Uh, you have it as a human being. Because just think of in a sense of way when you have a, a contract, like a mobile contract, right? In Germany, uh, we mobile contractor, uh, um, providers, they can reject you, right? Because of the model or something like that. And you need to understand why, right? This is very important. Um, this is an example that I took from uh, Dr. Wojciech Samek. He is, works for the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin. And he recently gave this talk uh, um, um, in front of my team, and it's about interpretable and trustworthy machine learning. And it's an example from the Pascal Voc Challenge, so similar to, to ImageNet. And we, he asks the question, why is this a boat? Why is this a train? And why is this a horse? So maybe can you, some of you tell me, why is this a boat? Some water in it. Huh? But why don't you say it's a boat because it's a boat in here, right? <laughs> Okay, why is it a train? Tracks. Okay, well, that's funny. <laughs> and why is it a horse? Okay, that's, that's actually very interesting because actually when we train a model, a model should define that this is a boat. It should not say it's water, right? It's the same thing here in, in a, in a, on, a, on a train. The model should say this is a train and not because there's rails, right? It's, it's the same thing with a horse. So the horse should be recognized and not like, you know, a human on the horse or something else. And what did the models, or all, they, like over the time, you know, it was a challenge over the years. And all the models that performed, they performed pretty well. But then they realized when they put like, you know, interpreter machine learning on that, that the machine was learning really weird patterns, right? So if you took like, you know, a little bit of crack cam here, so the model was learning, this is a boat because it's not a boat, because it's a boat because it's, because it's on water. So they had a lot of pictures that a boat on water, right? A similar thing to, uh, to, the, to the train. So it was on rails. So that's why it was so funny because, because you guys said it, right? Because, but actually the model should learn the train and not the rails because a rail is not a train, right? Similar thing to the horse. So it didn't learn a horse, but I'm not quite sure if you can see that, but it learned the caption here. So there was a lot of picture with, you know, like this caption, you know, and basically it learned the caption. So every time where it was a caption, it is a horse, right? And that's pretty important to understand because a lot of these technologies goes into critical systems like self-driving cars in the future, right? So if, if, if the model, you know, learns uh, there's a caption, there's a horse, and, you know, I just put a caption somewhere, you know, I can fake it, and then, you know, uh, the car can just kill the horse or something like that, right? So this is a pretty interesting uh, thing when you just look at that and, you know, see what the network is actually learning. Um, of course, CNNs these days can be explainable. So I think when you visit uh, Tipania's talk yesterday, you know, you saw the different techniques. Um, we also did a lot of work here as well, uh, especially for, for vision attribution techniques and visualization techniques. So attribution techniques, um, like this is one example, CRADCAM. Um, basically, it's a heat map, right? And it defines like where the highest activation in, in, in the future maps is, right? Um, there are f further methods like uh, saliency maps, uh, LRP, so layer-wise relevance propagation methods, right? But um, for me, I believe that CRADCAM is at the moment the best one because there's a recent paper also released by uh, Google where they tested a lot of different, um, like, of these methods. And um, the most stable one is CRADCAM, right? So, but uh, the area itself is evolving quite uh, fast. Another um, method is, like, visualization techniques or feature visualization. Basically, what it does, you know, um, basically, you, you have... Um, 
a neuron, right, which is differentiable to your input image. And basically, you start with some random noise, random jitter, and then you start to optimize the input uh, image, you know, according to that to see the highest activation in the neuron, right? And then you can see maybe some shapes here, right, at the, at the beginning, maybe, you know, very low level filter, right? And the end, you know, you, you see more the shapes that would uh, define this, this object. Okay, let's go to um, image ATM, so the library itself. So let's revisit the problem again. Um, very simple, you know, in a, in a tagging problem, what you do is you have to label the images, right? And then uh, you, this is your input data. And from the input data, you have to do some um, pre-processing or processing, right? Like, for example, image augmentation or something else. And then you put in a model and then the output. And then, of course, since we are in industry, uh, we also want to deploy it, right? So it's not a research project. So we really want to use it in our product. Uh, this whole thing was, when we started, super manual, right? So uh, I think overall it took us, like, the first setup took us probably a, a day, one or two days, right? And the next thing was, like, one or two hours, right? I mean, that's pretty fine, you know, if you have time, but. Uh, we're software engineers also by heart. We don't want to do that, right? This is like, uh, it's very mundane work, right? And it's also a soft problem. So when you solve an image tagging problem, uh, I don't want to solve another image tagging problem because it's very boring for me, right? I want to solve problems that is interesting, right? Um, and um, the initial idea was, of course, we cannot, you know, take any, everything uh, already, right? So we have to do step by step. And what we did is, you know, we, we map it like, okay, let's, let's tackle the input processing modeling output first, right? Because the labeling part is also very difficult. Because for the labeling part, you have many concepts as well, right? Whether you are internally building tools to label your data with your people, right? Or whether you are using Mechanical Turk solutions, right? Which is also not very trivial. I know what I'm talking about. It's uh, not that easy. And also deployment. Deployment is another uh, very, very, very uh, difficult task, right? When you think about deployment, you know, you need to think of where do you want to deploy it, right? How do you scale, right? So are you using Kubernetes for do this? How do you monitoring, right? Security, many, many things. A lot of people think that, you know, uh, that uh, coming, going from, from research to production it, uh, like is, is difficult, but they haven't seen after production, right? Because the production is also very, very, very difficult. And usually the case is, um, how, like, how should it look like? You know, you have some images, you put in some folders, right? So this step is, can be very tricky, right? Because a lot of people, when they put into different folders, how do they do this, right? You have a folder, you have a subfolder, sometimes people put all the images in one folder, right? So we also need some kind of abstraction there, right? And then afterwards, you know, you have, uh, some augmentation, right? So, for example, you, you enlarge your data set, you do image augmentation, you rotate your size, right? Uh, and then you, uh, of course, um, in, in machine learning, you know, we, what we do is pattern recognition, right? That means your, your distribution needs to be in a good way, right? So, for example, if you have an imbalanced data set, it will be very tricky, right? So you also need to take care of it. And then, of course, uh, since it's machine learning, right, since it's, it's not a specific uh, closed model, we also need to understand how well does this model generalize, right? So we need to put it in a test, train, validation split. And then afterwards, you know, could be the case you have autocaras, right, some kind of auto ML, because uh, I think um, there was a very nice quote yesterday from uh, Leonard where he said, uh, when you want to do hyperparameter optimization, hopefully you have a student or like a grad student or someone else, right, because I actually don't want to do that because it's very mundane. <laughs> you know, just sit there, you know, changing some numbers way 20 minutes later to see a change. It's uh, nothing that you would like to do, like if you really want to do really like interesting work, right? And then of course afterwards, you know, you get a model, you know, and then you want to interpret it, right? Because it's very important for, for, for us to understand as well. So what we built basically is covering this thing, it's called image ATM. Um, and basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's still new, right? So it doesn't mean we cover all the things, but uh, I'm just gonna go through what it can do already today. And maybe, you know, uh, you can also contribute it in the future. Um, so what is it? ATM is supposed to be a one-click tool solution for, you know, everyone to do just image classification, you know, and in a, in a very opinionated way. So we really need to, like, you know, we really defined how the folder should look like, how the data should look like, you know, uh, how we do the validation of the images, right, whether they are real uh, images or not, right. Um, and then, of course, what we wanted really important for us is uh, we're training a lot on, 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 on the cloud, right. So 
uh, for example, you know, it's not that easy to, to train on the cloud if you think about this, because, for example, let's say you train on AWS, are you using Boto3, you know, as a library to, to, uh, to um, kind of orchestrate it, or, like, or Terraform, any other tools, right? So it's also not that easy. And then uh, training and model evaluation as well, right? Um, it's available on, on GitHub, so you can actually check it out. It's uh, compatible at the moment with Python 3.6. Um, and it's uh, using still TensorFlow 1.3. So we, are, uh, we haven't used TensorFlow 2.0 uh, at this time because it was still uh, in alpha mode, right? So there was a lot of bugs in there. But I, I'm, on the roadmap, we only want to migrate to TensorFlow 2.0 in the future. Uh, how do you install it? Very easy. Like most Python user, pip install, right? So we made it as easy as possible. And of course, you can also just take bleeding edge as well, you know, from, from the uh, source code. Um, and in terms of usage, um, we defined two like options, right? Either you train it on command line or without the command line. Like you can use a Jupyter notebook or Google Colab, right? So this is the Google Colab. Uh, or the Jupyter um, option was very important for us because sometimes we have special problems that where you know where we still work on that and it's still very easy for us as well, right? Um, yeah, and I just want to show you a little bit of demo how it works. So, okay, um, okay. This is this is the documentation, and basically, you know, you install it, right? And uh, we also, you know, we have an opinionated way how you should define your, your folder structure. And we, we had a lot of discussion about this because, you know, this is, uh, this is crazy. But basically, uh, it's very easy. So you, you just need all the images in one folder. Um, you need a JSON file that basically, and you have your classes and um, your image ID, and then also a config file. So this is uh, basically uh, what you need to have. And then in the data JSON, you know, you need your image ID. So this is the direction for your, for your path and the label, right? So we chose that particular to do that because um, we also want to um, version control the data, right? So this is a very important thing uh, at the end of the day because when you're experimenting, right, some people, they just don't version control. You know, they just put a data in there and then next day, oh, new data comes in, but this is a different model, right? So we chose that way because, you know, you will still want to version control on the data.json in a different way, and the data itself is stored somewhere on S3, right? So you don't really need it uh, at the end of the day. Um, and then um, afterwards, um, like this is an example where I downloaded um, cats and dogs data, right? Um, and then basically wrote a little helper function to convert my file in this format um, here. And then afterwards, what I do, so when you can see here, this is uh, my folder structure. And when I just go into the config um, file JSON, I just need to define the image directory, so where it is sitting. So my data is currently in cats and dogs and train data. And then you need an output directory, right? In the output directory, you get the model and also the model output and the variation. Um, and then we have basically three classes, very simple. Uh, in this case, we have data preparation, right? So, and then we have an option why to run this because sometimes you just don't want to run a data preparation because your data is already prepared, right? And then you know you have the your sample file. Your sample file is the data where it rests to, right? And then uh, at the moment we have only the resize option, which means you can only resize images because. Um, at the end of the day, in image classification, you just don't take the full image, right? Because the full image will not fit into your uh, memory and GPU, right? So you want to reduce your file. And then, of course, you can train and evaluate uh, at the end of the day. So everything is, is true right now, right? And, um, oops. and when you just go into the data JSON file, so nothing spectacular, it's just the image ID and the label, right? And what you can do now is um, we have image ATM now also directed in, in um, in our CLI, right? We call the pipeline. We can also call the epoch dance, right? And then we can, um, in this case, I only want like one epoch dance and uh, one train all, right? And then I just put in the, the config file. And basically, it um, loads in the images now. Um, let's wait a little bit. I get a lot of uh, these warnings because, uh, you know, Keras is changing. So we also need to change as well. But um, so basically, you can see uh, here. There's some uh, image validation going on. Um, the cool thing on there is um, we also show the split and all this stuff. So this is very important. And we are using multi-parallel processing, right? So uh, you, will, you will use all the cores on your machine. So it's not like single processing. And then it's training, right? 
Um, of course, uh, I'm, I, I don't have a GPU on my machine here, so it's pretty slow. It's not made to train on this one, right? It's just to, to showcase you um, a little bit. Let's just wait a little bit until this finished training, um, because what I want to show you, um, like, after the CLI is, you can also just use um, like a Jupyter Notebook, right? And we made it very easy to train it on Google, uh, Google Colab. So basically, you can do the same thing. You go in a Google Colab, you just do pip install image ATM, right? Uh, it installs all the um, requirements. And then basically, um, I just download the cat and doc images again, right? Uh, let's go down. Um, and then here, just use the helper function, very small, just to transfer the data in the, in the JSON file. And then, um, as I said, it's the same thing. You have like three classes, right? You take the component data prep, you take your image directory, your sample directory, your job directory, um, you call run with resize, right? Um, then it resizes the images in this case. You know, you can see the class distribution. You can see uh, the split distribution that we want to choose. Um, then we go to training. We, we can also, you know, um, define the options. Epoch train, dense, epoch trains all right? And then it's just training. And right? so you s still see the typical uh, input, uh, uh, like input for, for a Keras model. What we do is a special thing. So um, in, in, a, in a lot of way, people, you know, just, like they just train the dense layer, right? And what we do is like a kick of training. So we just start training the dense layer, right, as, as long as possible, and then we start to train all layers, but like with a smaller learning rate, right? Because you don't want to change the, the, the rates that are being basically trained already in a transfer learning case, right? So it's also a special case of doing that. Um, and then we run the evaluation, uh, and this is something that you basically get, right? So you get the distribution in the test set, you do the prediction, and then you get your uh, um, uh, metrics, right, where you see your evaluation, precision recall, F1 score, right? And then, like, the confusion metrics as well, like, plotted. And then uh, what the cool thing is, um, we also, like, uh, use GradCam in there, right? So as a method. So basically, uh, this model is not, like, I only visualize stuff that is correct, right? Uh, incorrect. That means you can see, okay, this, this was dog, right? True, but it predicted cat. So, and you can also see now, okay, what was the reason why it was not a cat or why it was it not a dog, right? The same thing here. The model is not really trained for long, so uh, don't uh, interpret too much. It's just for testing, right? So if you want a good model, you, you really need to train it uh, for a more longer time. And then, you know, you can also look at, for example, like, Correct classes, right? So, for example, doggy identify the ear, right? Same thing here. Um, so, this is pretty cool. So, this is uh, pretty fast now. Um, and um, okay, it's still not finished. <laughs> okay, let's let's just uh, cancel this one because I, what I just want to show you here okay, is just when you go in image ATM and go and help, basically uh, what it does it shows you all the stuff which you can do, right? So you can go in further, like pipeline, right? It shows you also what you can change, right? So this is pretty easy, like uh, for, for a software engineer, right? So we, we had to do document it as best as possible because uh, we're not there all the time, right? Um, and then of course, on, on this example here, you can also see an initial example for cloud training, right? So we are using Terraform in the back end um, because uh, it's a good tool, basically, to orchestrate your cloud training, because it's also give a state as long as that, right? And we, you can, you know, use the IM role to define that. Um, I think, you know, if, if you are, like, using it privately, you get all access, but in a company context, you know, you are a user with no rights, <laughs> right? So basically, uh, um, we also define it for you. And then, you know, you, um, you basically just take your AWS access key, secret key, and then uh, there's another class, cloud, right? So where you cloud, you, you tag it, you take your provider, right? Um, the region, instance type bucket, right? And then uh, destroy it afterwards, right? So this is pretty simple for us. So we use it a lot now these days because our seven years, you know, they just use it, they, they, they run it, right? And it's elastic. That means, you know, you just don't spend money on things that you don't want to, right? That's, that's pretty good. All right. Um, okay. I'm, actually almost at the end. So um, the summary. So image ATM actually helped us to, to solve a good problem. So we reduce our training workflow from like um, a like couple of hours to minutes, right? So it's very, very short and very simple now for, for, for our, our users, our like some engineers, right? 
um, and also, you know, in the exception, and force people to like you know load the data in the correct way, right? Or you know store the data in a in a in a way that we want it, right? Because in the future we might you know do another training on that. Because you you have to think when you do image classification or any other machine learning case, you have to retrain that, right? So machine learning is like not only one-time training, right? But it has to retrain all the time, right? And uh, if it's already in a correct format, right? You you can use it like across a lot of different problems. And also, when you think about this way, if Idealo is creating these files in a correct format, I go to another unit, they create it also in a similar format, and it's very easy then for me, right? Um, this library is now extensively used at Idealo, so they did it for other classes, like uh, classes, washing machines, cameras, uh, cameras smartphones, um, and there's a lot of use cases. So for example, in this case, this is a sneaker gallery, so it's not beta anymore. Um, sneakers is uh, very important because I don't know, like Germans like buying sneakers. That's why Salon was so popular. And basically, uh, no, it does it automatically for all the sneakers. And we have a lot of sneakers. So it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, yeah, this is like a snapshot of our roadmap, what we want to do. So of course, we want to upgrade to TensorFlow 2.0 and take advantage of uh, all the advantages that they have, like gradient tape, you know, and all the subclassing APIs. Um, we want to take auto ML capabilities. So at the moment, we are just using our kind of experience to do the training. Um, but the reason why we didn't take uh, auto ML is, um, for example, if you train it on a on an MNIST data set, right, it can take up to eight hours at the moment, right? Uh, it's, I mean, it sounds cool that you don't need to do that, but spending eight hours on AWS on a GPU is just a lot of money when you just think that you just take a transfer learning model and do it for 10 minutes. You have the same accuracy, right? So you have to think about that, right? Is it worth the time of eight hours versus like, you know, transfer learning? Um, we want to have more interpretive techniques, but we have to still think what is good there. Um, we want to have a PDF report output. At the moment, um, it, you can only see it on a Jupyter notebook. Uh, more image documentation techniques as well, right? Um, Semi-supervised learning, this is um, something that is pretty cool. It just came out this year, you know, like a couple of papers, also from Google Brain. Um, in the same way that you um, take care or take advantage of, like, you know, training on a lot of data, right? Like, that's why it's unsupervised first. And then, you know, use it basically to uh, solve your problem in a supervised manufacturer. And this way, you don't need a lot of data, right? So, because most of the image classification problems, you need a lot of data, right? So, data is a, this is a very data hungry problem. And uh, a lot of people are kind of like working in the area to, to, to solve it. Um, Image application is something that we're also working on. It's also coming soon. It's not integrated in the package. It will be a separate package. Um, it is very important because um, if you just think on Cypher 10, uh, there were a lot of duplicates in there, right? So when you think about uh, like, um, like duplication in the images, it causes a lot of problems, right? Because when you have a train and a test data set and they have a duplication there, it will kind of bias your results, right? And this is a big problem because a lot of People, they just don't think about that. And of course, the reason why also why we are building this, there's a lot of uh, um, um, stuff out there already, but they are not good, right? So, um, all right. This is a team that built it. Uh, I was not alone, right? So uh, I'm, ne I'm never alone on that. And I think uh, the credits goes to more to the team than me, because I was just you know doing a lot of management work and basically uh, also uh, showing you know the direction, but uh, like the real work you know is done by the team itself. Um, of course, we are looking for contributors. So if you like, contribution means also you're using that in your company. You know, you file a bug, right? And you know, uh, issue uh, file an issue on, on GitHub, right? It doesn't it doesn't mean that you also contribute in a sense of way for code, but it would be good. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs> and this was my talk. Um, hey, thank you. Um, that fantastic. Um, my question was more around. Uh, now you eliminated the manual workflow that you said for image yeah. tagging, but uh, what is the quality of images that you're getting? In the sense, yesterday we had a talk from Zoom Car where they said, you know, if images are taken in dim light or in different angles, it mm. causes a problem. Yeah. So now, when you have so many products, uh, what is the process to ensure that the quality of images that you're getting, and yeah. then comes image tagging, is actually good, and what part of that is manual? Yeah. So at the moment, uh, um, the part of tagging, like the initial tagging, is very manual because we, the, the content workers are still doing that, right? 
or a part of my team at the end of the day, right? And in order to ensure that, you can, for example, do different experiments, right? So let's say when you, like a lot of people, like for example, Fourier and reception, it's very hard for people to understand the differences between those two, right? So you can do multiple votes or something like that, right? And in terms of your other question, um, for the quality of angle and so on, usually product images, they are really good. Like it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, something that uh, people take with a camera, right? But they come from the shop, right? But this data is just unlabeled, right? So I, we really don't have any problems with quality because uh, the, all the shops itself, they have good images because they need it for their own shops as well, right? Hi, uh, so is there a good application for this kind of process in photojournalism? Mm. Well, yes, uh, there is. For, uh, for example, for one of our companies, uh, it's called Access Experience Indication, uh, they pay a lot of money just to label images, right? And they are paying, this image, uh, paying labeling these images already for a couple of years. Because at the end of the day, um, these images also get sold back to other media companies, right, in journalism. For example, Getty Images doing that, you know, or the DPA, right? And they are also labeling these images away. And it's very time consuming. And a lot of stuff, you can, image it already, uh, you can label it already, right? Thank you. I have an out with the token section. So, uh, like you said, that it's really sort of there. So yeah. Does the model uh, make itself, the architecture is the made by the model itself, or you make the architecture and then you go Yeah. Well, at the moment, we're not really using AutoCaros um, because uh, of this eight hours uh, problem, right? Um, but in the future, um, I would say the best solution would be that you take an initial architecture, right, and then put AutoCaros on that. Um, I mean, you, you have a different solution. I mean, that's why you have NAS and eNAS systems, right? Where you basically, hey, train a model, take this third model, or check, you know, or you do it iteratively. Like, you know, start from the first hidden layer, right, and then add, add, add this. But the first approach, when you just add from a, like a random layer, right, and add more and more and more layers and, and stack under that, it can take a long time to find the right model, right? I think for this kind of problems, you should take an initial model and then, you know, put, put on top of that. Hi, I had a question, sorry. If, when we use the image ATM, actually, can we configure all the layers in the neural network? Mm -hmm. Or it's only the dense layer? Because you showed only the dense layer. Yeah. Can we configure dropout layers and other layers? Uh, actually, not. <laughs> so, because um, we have to enforce it, right? Otherwise, if you really want to have custom layers and do something else, I think you should uh, use Keras, TensorFlow, uh, or like PyTorch itself, right? Because uh, for very special problems, we're not using that, right? Because we, this problem is only, like, it's a special problem. It's only necessary when you need to scale, right? So when you need to put it, like, you know, in, in many, many different categories, right? It doesn't make sense when you just train once with a custom layer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, here first. Okay. So the, the gentleman asked, uh, how does it perform, um, like, against state-of-the-art models? Um, I mean, this, is, this depends on what you mean with state of the art. State of the art sometimes just get 2% of accuracy more, right, or less. Uh, of course, it's not beating that, but the problem is uh, we don't, because if we have 90% or 95%, it's enough for us, right? It's, it's not like we need 99%. <laughs> Uh, at the moment, we give recommendation. So recognition engineers, okay, take 20 epochs, right? And there's also logic behind this as well. You know? So it's not, it's not something uh, completely random at the end of the day. Yeah, we are running short of time. Sorry for that, actually. Yeah. Can, <laughs> yeah. He's available anyway yes. outside. I'm, I'm available outside. And if you want the slides, uh, I already put it on uh, speaker deck. But I think the slides are also available on... Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll publish uh, the sites we'll later. Publish yeah. Anyways. yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you.